Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for joining the University of Miami Alumni Association and the Palm Beach County Canes to take part in today's Cane Conversation. Sustainability, how isolation protocols changed our environment. My name is Melanie McDonald. I am a proud alumna of the University of Miami and president of the Palm Beach County Canes community, which is over home to 4,000 of our alumni. I'm happy to see that we have alumni from all over the country joining us today, and I encourage you to stay connected to our U. Some ways you can do this are by visiting our UM Alumni Association website, alumni.miami.edu. You can also bookmark your respective Canes community page via the alumni website so that you can stay up to date on anything that's happening in your community. And of course, make sure to follow the University of Miami Alumni Association accounts on Facebook, as well as Twitter and Instagram at um underscore alumni. Now, before I turn things over to our speakers for tonight, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with everyone because of the large attendance for this presentation. The chat feature will not be available. We ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screens and it will remain open throughout the presentation. We will do our best to answer your questions within the time allotted. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our event mod moderator, Xavier Cortada. He is a graduate of the University of Miami, AB 86, JD 91, MPA of 91. Xavier is an artist and professor of practice at the University of Miami in the Department of Art and Art History. Xavier's work is particularly environmentally focused and is intended to generate awareness and actions toward issues of global climate change. So thank you for joining us for this Keynes conversation. Xavier, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Melanie. It's my pleasure to be here as a very, very proud alumnus. And I, uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be part of this really important Kane conversation on uh, sustainability. As you know, um, since the pandemic, the world has changed. Our way of interacting uh, with one another has changed. There has been a wholesale transformation in the way we see things, in the way we see ourselves. And I think, I hope, and if not, these wonderful speakers, I think, will help us uh, broaden our understanding on the way we see our connection to the natural world. If anything, this pandemic has exposed some vulnerabilities, some things we never really looked at, but now see differences in. Uh, everything from how interconnected we are at every uh, scale, whether it is uh, how we uh, consume goods, how those are fabricated, how they get to us, to, and most importantly, how interconnected we are to the entire planet and how climate change and how environmental factors really impact everything because at the very end we too are biological beings so it's really uh, an incredible opportunity to talk and explore how our new normal our isolated way of being has um changed had has changes in our environment and how these new protocols these new ways of existing of engaging of living um, have had an impact and I think importantly through our discussions at the end we'll explore just how um, those lessons are really going to shape our personal behavior and our society behavior in the years to come and to do that I think we would love to start by having two of our brightest right as a, as a proud alum this University of Miami um, has given each of us, you know, formation, helped us develop a way of thinking and has helped us advance in our careers. And there are faculty who stay at our university year after year, developing knowledge, literally discovering new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing. And Rasmus, the Rosenstiel School, is one of those really special gifts, one of those gems that our university has its world-renowned reputation for developing and advancing science, particularly 
uh, necessary today when we as a society feel so impacted by climate change, by the climate emergency that we're feeling, which of course um, this pandemic is interconnected to. So I'd like to tell you who our two speakers are. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Gerald Alt, uh, PhD, uh, a graduate of 1988, is a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Marine and Ecosystems and Society at the University of Miami. He's also the director of the Tarpon and Bonefish Research Center. Dr. Alt is an internationally renowned fishery scientist specializing in population dynamics, predictive analytics, sampling design, risk assessment, and ecosystem modeling. He's an avid recreational fisherman, considered the world's foremost authority on tarpon and bonefish. He frequently lectures to fishing organizations and has been featured on National Geographic, CNN, CBS, Sunday Morning, CNBC Squaw, Animal Planet, the BBC, NPR, to name just but a few. He has also contributed articles for the Miami Herald, the LA Times, the London Financial Times, the Chicago Tribune, Reuters, the Huffington Post, and the New York Times. Our second speaker is Kayla Besson, a three-year, a third-year PhD student in atmospheric sciences, also at the University of Miami Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. She focuses on understanding how atmospheric blocking, traffic jams in the atmosphere, affect weather and climate forecasting on seasonal to decadal timescales. In 2017, Kayla received a BS in Environmental Resources Engineering from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She's a weather, <laughs> she's a weather nerd at heart with a passion for the environment that fuels an interest in sustainability at the intersection of climate and society. She hopes to bring awareness to sustainability through science. So let's first start with Dr. Alt. Dr. Alt um, is going to uh, uh, provide us a presentation on the ecological and economic importance of Florida's coral reef fisheries and makes sustainability a key conservation concern. Sustainability is defined as the ability of exploited fish stocks to maintain sufficient reproduction that produces similar yields into the indefinite future. However, sustainability is threatened by overfishing, pollution, and changes in our climate. And Dr. Alt will discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on the fishing capital of the world, assess biological and economic risks, and prognosticate on the future of this fabulous ecosystem. Dr. Alt, it's such an honor for us to have you present. Welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Xavier, for the very kind remarks. I really appreciate being here this afternoon. What I'd like to talk about is really the incredible environment that we live in here in South Florida, and it's Florida's coral reef ecosystem. That ecosystem supports diverse natural communities that provide the foundation for lucrative fishing and tourism industries. And I've really developed an appreciation for the ecosystem broadly in South Florida, uh, being here in Miami for now 37 years at the university. Uh, in addition to my appreciation of it, the state legislature also appreciates it from the ecological and economic benefits that it provides to Florida uh, by naming South Florida fishing capital of the world uh, because it generates on the order of about $10 billion a year uh, economic revenues and more than 300,000 jobs. Uh, interestingly enough, that value is now greater than Florida's citrus industry, which historically has been, if you will, the king in Florida. So really, sport fishing, the marine environment is this incredible environment that we live in. That environment, the history of it, though, goes way back. And here I have some photos that show uh, South Florida in the early, the nascent days of development. In fact, the picture in the upper right there's a photo that I found in Key Largo that said, you know, a typical day of fishing in Key Largo in the 1920s. And I think if you look at these pictures, you realize that what's typical now is not what was typical then. Things have changed. Things have changed dramatically over time. 
And understanding that change is part of kind of understanding, if you will, this how COVID is interacting with the system. So part of it is to decide how it is that we sustain systems. In fisheries, we have a pretty clear definition of that. It's basically the ability of exploited fish stocks to maintain sufficient reproduction, right, producing new fish uh, so that you can produce similar yields, and those yields could be dollars, they could be enjoyment, they could be all kinds of things. But you want to do that into the indefinite future. And to do that really needs a risk perspective to look at the biological and economic risks associated with use of the system. Walking back down memory lane, if we look at Miami in 1920, uh, about the time that the university was developed, uh, South Florida, Miami was pretty much a, you know, an agricultural area, farm fields, et cetera. This is downtown, right on downtown Miami with the Miami River coming in. You can see developments very low at that time. And so human impact is low and the systems were operating pretty much naturally. But over time, things changed. Uh, population growth has exploded. Uh, I marked basically the 1920 population of Florida. It was less than a million. We just passed uh, 21 and a half million folks in the state in 2019. That population is going to double. We're basically about 2035, so 40 million people in the state. Associated with that has been explosive growth of the, if you will, the fishing fleets. Uh, the commercial industry has been relatively flat, but of course there's been changes in uh, technology, uh, communication networks, hydroacoustics, vessel design, etc. But what's been really remarkable is the explosion of the recreational fleets. They've increased basically 700% since the, since the mid-1960s. Uh, and and uh, it's expected the fleet size, which is a million vessels in Florida, is going to double by the year 2030. So we have issues about how we interact with that dynamic natural system. So this is a picture basically of South Florida. It's uh, the bathymetry, which is the larger picture with the inset showing the currents, essentially the heat transport and currents that occur in Florida. So if you will, we're south or rather north of where the Caribbean Sea is dumping between Mexico and Cuba, that water and heat, et cetera, is brought through, through, through and by South Florida in the Straits of Florida. It exits, in fact, it's the, the warmth of that, exporting all the heat from the Caribbean, keeps Europe warm in the winter. And interestingly enough, if you think about Florida as being, you know, how, how flat is Florida, if I take a line and draw over from Cape Canaveral to or rather from Tampa to Cape Canaveral and comes south to uh, uh, Cape Sable here, it's three feet of slope. But if I go six kilometers seaward, it's a mile deep. So Florida sits up on this peninsula, essentially the interaction of the, the warm waters bathe the coral reef system that runs from the dry tortugas. And pay attention to this, we're gonna come back to dry tortugas later. But this red along the line is the coral reef ecosystem that essentially is, is what we're talking about. That system, if you will, it's an interaction between the terrestrial environment uh, uh, and and the, the ocean. So the Everglades restoration activity has changed the historical flows of freshwater down the down the peninsula, basically to allow this phalanx of humanity to exist here on the the right. Essentially, is about seven million people packed between the Palm Beaches and and Dade County. So we're basically loving the system to death. That system, though, is a natural system. If I slice anywhere along the, the reef track, if you will, kind of to cut across it, it's a conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt is that, if you will, a lot of the biomass is out of the deep reef. Things are brought back to the shore side where we live. And then as they grow, mature, et cetera, they move seaward. That's an interaction of the ocean uh, atmosphere and the biology. But this interaction of humans in that fringe creates a big issue as to how the dynamics work. So in many cases, we've broken down the productivity of the system. How has that happened? Well, let's start with looking at that same picture I was showing you about Miami in 1920 with the 2020 picture, and you begin to see that Miami is starting to look like little Manhattan, and that development has changed very, you know, very significantly the kinds of natural communities that exist along the shoreline, but also pollution and development and use. That use, in fact, has reached staggering proportions. Uh, here's a picture uh, of, uh, actually, it's Columbus Day Regatta. It's about a two by two square mile area. The pr 
probably a couple thousand votes in this photo, not photoshopped. It just gives you a sense about the level of human use. And so imagine you're Mr. Grouper trying to swim to the reef. You've got a gauntlet to run through that makes it very difficult to think about what sustainability would be. So when we look at the reef fish community, which exists of, you know, it's literally hundreds of fishes, but there's about 50 plus fishes that are the target of the recreational and commercial fishery. Uh, things that are sustainable are down here in the lower right quadrant. Okay, and you see a few species, things that are overfished, meaning they're getting too much love, too many are being removed, there's not enough reproduction to sustain the future. Uh, essentially 70% of the snapper grouper complex in today's environment is overfished. So it creates an issue about how we move forward and what sustainability looks like. Well, interestingly enough, COVID's provided us a breath of air, a breath of fresh air to some extent uh, with the natural environment that we're seeing uh, behaviors and arrivals of animals, birds, fishes, et cetera, that are remarkable. The tarpon, in fact, passed through here during uh, April, May on their way north to Chesapeake Bay and the Mississippi River Plume in masses. Uh, bird behavior like the great blue heron was significant. We saw a lot more birds, migratory, et cetera. And then when we look in the ocean, we see animals behaving essentially more naturally uh, essentially with reducing the pressure. So the COVID essentially shut down the marinas, shut down the, the boat ramps, the, nobody out on the water, and gave animals essentially a, a walk back in time to look at the way it was. So when we look at that, so here's an example of kind of the way this would work. We've actually in Florida implemented what are called marine reserves. This is out in the dry tortugas. The picture I'm showing in its example for mutton snapper, uh, favored fish of the reef community, but every place you see a white dot here, essentially we went looking with four divers in a randomized design uh, to see if we could find uh, any mutton snapper. Where we saw fishes are the black dots, the numbers we see or the density are the are relate, relate of a size of that dot. So this is prior to implementation of spatial closure where essentially uh, no extractive fishing, etc. So the the Tortugas North Ecological Reserve is this area that I'm pointing to in the upper part. The Dry Tortugas, the Dry Tortugas National Park is kind of this elliptical area. The entire uh, western side of the park was shut down, and then only recreational fishing is, occurs in the eastern side of the park. Well, you say, okay, what happens over time? Well, remarkably, what happens over time is that fish get larger, there's more of them. So we essentially, that biomass can swim out and satisfy the rest of the keys because the tortugas are at the ups upstream side of the, uh, of the ecosystem. And then also it can export larvae essentially upstream towards Miami, et cetera. So there are benefits to giving the system a break and understanding essentially how that works is an important part. COVID's been part of that. So we set up models essentially for prediction. So without going through a large description of this, other than we try to put the environment together with the animals and then the human effect to forecast how things work. And the space, the scales with which we need to look at it are not necessarily strictly South Florida, but more holistic looking at, you know, things that come through seasonally. These are satellite tagged uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna, the giants. And they utilize ocean heat content, which turns out to be the lower bound temperature of tropical cyclone generation. But you see they utilize these pathways and moving along the sea in natural ways. And so this is developed as, you know, in, is in evolution. And so the point I'm making is this is spring, about the time that COVID started. And the giant blue fins pass through our area, essentially to take advantage of the resources that are, you know, blossoming at that time. In fact, move all the way to Nova Scotia. So understanding, if you will, the teleconnections of the system really has to put together the, uh, the ocean, the atmosphere, the animals, and man in an integrated way. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say in the context of sustainability and conservation is that you know, health of the system is defined as this ability for self-renewal. Renewal and conservation is this effort to understand and promote the capacity for self-renewal. The role of science in this process is to understand the conditions necessary for self-renewal, and the role of management is to use that science to create conditions that promote self-renewal. 
So I thank you for your time and uh, Xavier, back to you. Thanks folks. Thank you so much for uh, uh, t uh, talking to us about this, Dr. Alt and I. Um, whatever, um, through our discussion after um, our next speaker speaks, I'll try to uh, see if we can get the audio fixed and ask you a little bit more about the questions, particularly the work uh, being done with supercomputers, uh, how uh, COVID has taken people uh, out of the water and how we've seen um, some of those changes. But um, maybe if, the, if our team can just sort of reach out to you, make sure that the microphone situation has worked, maybe through text or something, uh, we, can, we can make that work. Or maybe look at the chat. Uh, so again, to the audience listening, uh, thank you so much for your, your patience. Next, I'm so thrilled to present um, Kayla Besson, who will be uh, providing a new perspective of sustainability, revealing how we as humans are a large part of our global ecosystem. She will show how stresses to this system, such as COVID-19, result in large imbalances in some areas while simultaneously allowing other parts of the system to rebound. Further, she will provide some suggestions on individual actions you can take to help you reduce your impacts on our ecosystem moving forward. Kayla, thank you so much for joining us. If you would, please present. Thank you, Xavier. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming. Um, is, um, so I have my first slide here. Um, there is no sound on these videos. So um, I wanted to start talking about some of the headlines everyone might be seeing, um, especially associated with COVID-19 and our environment. Um, so, you know, you might have seen some of these videos from Miami Waterkeeper. They're a great conservation group here in Miami. Um, that there's very rare fish, such as sawfish, um, being sighted in ways they've never been sighted before. There's headlines showing that the water quality is getting better and fewer boats mean, you know, a safer space for things like manatees and, you know, other marine life, such as the baby turtles that you can see over in the corner. Um, so I think this is very interesting, right, because these are headlines. And it's interesting because why are we so shocked to see these types of things happening? Why are we so shocked to see that suddenly, oh, it's like, oh, the humans went inside, they went into quarantine, so the fish came out for a party. <laughs> why are we so shocked by this? Because if you really think about it, every day as a human in our given society, it is very likely that you are tied to a source of pollution whether that's driving in your car to work um, or turning on a light or some of the food you eat might be able to, or is likely able to be traced to a source of pollution. So it should come as no surprise that when we go inside that some of these things such as the water quality, the air quality, marine life, animals in general are starting to be seen everywhere, right? So there's this idea of a lack of connection of us as a society and how we're impacting things like our environment or a lack of environmental consciousness, right? And so thinking even further and knowing the internet how it is, you might have also seen some of these things such as the earth is healing, we are the virus. So the baby turtles are coming out, but there's also rainbow dolphins in the Hudson River, right? No. This is a little too far. And of course, it's always like this, where there's always this extreme side to things, but I really don't think that uh, we are the virus. I don't think that there's a problem. I think the way we interact with our environment is a problem. Um, and so we're gonna think about this a little bit further through sustainability. And we're like, oh, <laughs> here we go. Sustainability, a hippy dippy concept that we're going to dive into and no. So one of the things that I really want to talk about and what I'm really hoping for is a new perspective um, on sustainability and what it actually is. Okay, so if you look up sustainability, you can see that it's the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level, right? So how long can you sustain a given state? 
how long can you sustain holding weights above your head, right? A very simple objective term of to sustain. An even broader application is to maintain ecological balance. And that's where this idea of environmentalism comes into play, right? Um, but so I want to go beyond that and think about sustainability more of a uh, different kind of term, right? So I always tell the story about sustainability and how it's kind of a lost art as well. Because growing up, I was always babysitted by my grandparents. And so my grandmother, she would, you know, maybe make chicken for dinner one night. Um, and then, you know, then we'd have chicken soup because you would use the carcass or the bones to make a broth. And then maybe the next day, you'll see a Cool Whip container in the fridge and you'll open it and it's not Cool Whip, it's the chicken soup or the leftovers, right? Because it's beyond this idea of, um, again, a hippy dippy concept, but a idea of not over consuming and realizing that in reducing your waste, using what you have, right? You always might not have to buy new or do something extra. So this is something I was raised with to understand. And now it's this huge thing that uh, companies are sustainable and yada, yada. Um, but it's a very simple concept of not over consuming. And so sustainability, the more objective term and how I'm going to present it here um, was taught to me in one of my economic classes um, in undergrad. And so it's described in, you may have heard of the triple bottom line. And so that means sustainability is defined with three different pillars, economic, environmental, or social. And if you think about it further and more fun, people, profit, and planet. So you won't forget that. People, planet, profit. And in the intersection is sustainability. That's pretty cool. But let's dive into this a little bit further. So you have people, planet, and profit, right? But sustainable solutions also need to be equitable, viable, and bearable, right? You can't just have something that supports one pillar or two pillars, or there won't be a balance. And this isn't easy, right? The sustained human ecosystem, especially at local and even global scales, it's not easy. There's a lot of different components that go into this, right? So you have things like social injustices, you have things like jobs and employability, political ideologies, pollution control, waste reduction, human health. These are all things that are contributing to a very, very complex system. And it's not easy to have sustainable solutions, but they are possible, right? And so many of these components and part of why we get unbalanced, it's not just of our own undoing, right? There are things that happen and come along and rock the boat, if you may well, right? So we have different stresses on our applied system. One of these stresses and how I often present this is through climate change. It is a long-term low frequency stressor growing in the background, right? So climate change isn't something that you will look outside and see. Well, we might hear Miami with sea level rise, but not everywhere you can see direct impacts of climate change, though um, in other places uh, you can, right? So it's growing in the background. Where something else like COVID-19 is a more rapid and applied intense stressor that we had to react to quickly. And so we can dive into that a little bit further and understand a huge large stressor such as human health growing and getting larger. So how is that affecting our balanced human ecosystem? Well, we know this, society is struggling, we're hurting, we're stressed out, quarantine is hard and a lot of people aren't doing well. Also what's not doing well is our economy. It is not doing so great, but what else are we seeing? Well, we saw the baby turtles, we saw the sawfish, the planet is rebounding, right? And so different parts of our sustained human ecosystem are playing sort of a tug of war, right? So this is very, very interesting. Um, and so you might've seen some of these things and you're sitting in quarantine wondering, 
what can I do? I do see this. I want to save the turtles. They're very cute. And I realize I'm making an impact and I can make changes. Well, there are some things that you can do. And I love this paper. It's a published research paper that was in uh, the environmental research letters in 2017. So this is new. And it's a bar graph showing um, your amount of reductions that you can do in uh, CO2, so you're reducing your carbon footprint. And it's even broken down by country, right? Because we understand that different countries have different impacts and emissions, yada, yada. Right, so these are proven things that you can do in small changes to um, reduce your carbon footprint. And I always recommend some of these, you know, so some of them aren't, you know, quite right. Like having one fewer child, that's just science being science saying, if you have one less, there's less resources. I don't really uh, fall into that, but um, I do live car free, right? So I bike uh, to Rasmus and back and it's great. You know, I get my exercise, I get some sunshine. Um, I'm not emitting um, any CO2 with a car and I'm saving money. Um, that's not feasible for everyone. That might not be a sustainable solution for everyone, right? That might not be a viable solution, but maybe you can avoid one transatlantic flight. Do you really need to go to Fiji twice a year? Probably not. But there's also other small things that you can do, such as washing your clothes in cold water, right? Just literally doing a wash cycle in cold water. I know it doesn't get stains out as well, but you know, think about it. Um, it's even better than recycling. So small integrated changes, maybe three less plastic disposable items. Do you really need to buy a big thing of water bottles all the time? That's also a waste of money. You can buy one bottle one time and drink water. <laughs> Reducing your food waste. Again, the example from my grandmother's, make a soup with your chicken carcass if you decide to eat meat. Or eat meat less, one less day a week. That doesn't mean you have to go vegetarian or vegan. It's just maybe one less meal a week. That's it, it's not that hard. And you'll even feel healthier as well. And meat tends to be a lot more expensive in the stores as well too. So again, sustainable solutions that are very easy. And also voting. This one is huge and is very impactful. And while I'm not advocating for any particular candidate, um, I do think there are clear candidates that would promote better sustainable solution than others, right? Um, so also other little experiments that you can do on your own. So we have, um, we have <laughs> been quarantining and working from home all days during the week. So when this is over, if you don't wanna fully give up your nice quarantine routine, you know, with your slippers and not rushing around, um, if you continue to do that twice a week, two out of five is a 40% reduction in your commuter related emissions if you're driving, right? So small changes. You don't have to live car free fully, just small things, maybe twice a week again, right? So think of the baby turtles or think of, you know, anything that might change your perspective on all of this. And remember, you don't have to go full hippie in the woods um, or anything like that either. You can just do small little things that help make you more aware of what's happening around you. So with that, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kayla. I so appreciate you uh, sharing um, the knowledge that you too are developing. And it's great to have this spectrum, right? Someone who is finishing her PhD and someone who has been leading our university um, in developing knowledge for four decades. And we're both sitting here, I mean, I'm sitting here with both of you at this, at this intersection in time when we're looking at um, environmental issues, I'd like to call them climate um, emergency issues, and um, this pandemic. And to state the obvious, this pandemic is a consequence in many ways of our impact on the climate. Deforestation, as we all know, um, destroys ecosystems, it destroys wilderness habitats where animals, all of whom which carry viruses, are now coming into proximity with humans that they would have never been proximity uh, before. 
they're stressed as this happens. And um, there are different vectors of disease, whether it is uh, a warmer climate bringing tropical diseases to South Florida, a place that is having hotter and hotter summers, or um, whether it is the conditions of, of people eating animals that um, have been, uh, again, um, infected by interaction with other species that they would have not normally interacted with, a, a wet market, for example. So clearly these are human impacts on the environment. And just like Dr. Alt uh, demonstrated in, um, in his slides, the lack of human impact in an ecosystem for this period of time sees results. The same way as broader climatic issues, uh, hotter temperatures having the fish in different parts of the Gulf of Mexico, the impact of um, climate um, on our environment, on our reefs, on our ecosystems, impacts the climate. And I just want to have a discussion between both of you, with the three of us, just talk a little bit briefly. And, and I'd like to look at that picture of Key Largo that Dr. Alt showed us as, I think, a point of reference. That picture was taken in the 1920s. We had the Spanish uh, flu in about 100 years ago as well. The world was completely um, different from an ecological point of view. You can't cache a fish, a fish that size in Calargo today if you wanted to, right? It doesn't exist. But present day humans have short term memories about what was. A picture like that brings it uh, to your um, to your, you know, to, to your, to your um, ability to see, to your, to, 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 to your perspective. And you were talking a little bit about low frequency, right? Sort of low frequency events of climate change, things that aren't so visible, sort of like you don't know that you're not seeing a giant fish because you haven't seen one before. Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering if we could talk about COVID-19 I um, and and climate change and how, you know, clearly uh, cutting trees uh, and emitting greenhouse gases and not having the trees to absorb that carbon means that there's more greenhouses, more pollutants in the atmosphere, which means that there's more particulates in our lungs at the same time that an infectious disease that has pulmonary consequences is making us more susceptible to die from the disease than if we didn't have that kind of pollution. So in this world where there's this intersection between the pandemics that are exacerbated by human impacts um, and our short-term memory, in fact, too many people are leaving their homes right now as if the disease wasn't there. Um, you know, we couldn't even take three months of quarantining before needing to to, to, to come outside. And I just want to have a, a little conversation with the three of you about that. Where, where do you think we are? So we're seeing the science, we're seeing 100 year ago science, we're seeing present, 100 year ago images, present day science, we know what's happening with climate. But do we as a society, through our policymakers and our own behavior, have the ability to take these lessons that you're showing us and really respond to them after the pandemic goes away? Dr. Alt, what do, you, what do you think? Well, I hope you can hear me, first of all. Uh, I'm an optimist. And, you know, the, as you were speaking, a couple things came to mind. Some fundamental mathematical relationships we use about population growth, if you will, is the exponential curve. And so when I was showing you population growth in Florida, it clearly is on an exponential curve. Well, that's a lot like COVID transmission, right? Because we were talking about bending the curve, right? Bending the curve and we'll be better because we reduce the transmission frequency. Well, uh, the underlying part of that is nature's a really strong force and it's extremely resilient. And so, you know, going back in time before the pressures were large is that, you know, all these individual populations grew up to large sizes, big fish, et cetera. And so, if you will, the, the human effect was a bit like the COVID effect, meaning we're knocking down those populations, right? Reducing the size, et cetera. Those are the things we can view. 
I, you know, my optimistic side of this, my glass half full, is saying that if we get control on the things that we do and understand how they interact with the system, these systems have powerful ability to regenerate. And that's really where we've got to focus or, you know, what are the stress points? How are we operating within it? I mean, we can do small things, but I kind of think large, you know, that for the greater good. And, and so there's some things that we're, you know, have to give up, if you will, or change the attitude that give us the opportunity of wanting to get greater benefits today and larger, much larger benefits that we're handing off in the future. So, uh, you know, I, again, I've taken the high side of this thing and hoping that the COVID story will, will pass. But I think the, le the lesson, the legacy it leaves with us is realizing, gosh, we do have this impact. And when we look around the system, we see some very encouraging things about recovery. And give nature a chance, like I say, and it will surprise you every time. It's a beautiful thing, but we just have to understand the principles that operates by. Kayla, your generation is going to um, see uh, more and more climatic changes in the years to come. Your generation is living through its first, well, a lot of us living through our first pandemic, but you know, Students at the University of Miami had to leave their classrooms and go on an online uh, platform midway through last semester. And, you know, it, it is, it's got to be, uh, you know, as, um, as shocking to them as to anyone else. But what do you think the response is going to be from your peer group uh, to this, to this uh, pandemic? Will, they, will the lessons learned be heeded? Uh, yeah, so this is kind of funny because while Dr. Alt has taken on a sense of optimism, I think, at least from our perspective, we are a little bit uh, less so, um, just especially from the fact from a climate perspective. Um, we've already kind of cashed a carbon ticket that we can't get back, right? So we've already emitted enough carbon into the atmosphere that we are going to see um, a at least one and a half degrees warming uh, by a maximum of 2050, right? So this is something that is happening and something that we do know, right? And so that does require us as a society to change and adapt, similar to how we are with COVID. And our response to COVID has been, at least from my perspective, kind of a nightmare right? Because we can't sit inside for three months. We can't listen to the rules. We're not listening to scientific fact. We're not being good people. We're not wearing masks or anything like that. And so I think it is going to be a difficult challenge for society to adapt, adapt to climate change. Um, I do think the bright side and the silver lining is that nature is a force and it will rebound. It will be here whether we are or not. So uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to open it up now just to, to our, um, you know, to, to our uh, community that they've been asking some questions. So I'm going to try to ask them really quickly and see if I can get some, some quick answers because there's several, there's several questions here. Um, I think we touched upon it a little bit, especially with your videos, but what aspects of, what aspects of COVID-19 have been beneficial to Florida's natural resources? I think this was addressed in the slides, but is there something else anyone wants to add to that? Okay, or how can we better teach about the importance of the environment uh, to business students? Again, uh, that chart you gave us was inspired by one of your business courses, you know. Well, I'd like to say something, though, returning just for a moment, given this, you know, the change The you know, I could be chicken little and, oh, God, the world, the sky is falling as compared to, you know, systems are compensatory that changes, changes a constant. And, and so what I know is it's been warmer in the past. Sea levels have been higher in the past. Now the question is, what's the force that's driving it one direction? But animals, if you will, the things that we love, that we want to use, have this capacity for the change. So I say, again, going back to my optimistic point of view, we sit in a place technologically, right? We're, we're looking at a world in a way that we've never had the capacity. You know, what did we know 100 years ago? What do we know now? Infinitely more. 
And that's where I think the optimism needs to sit because I think we can use that to minimize, to mitigate the risks, the, you know, the, let's say the business side of the ledger, to get highest production of the things that we like. And that's a whole range of benefits, you know, from going fishing up on the dock, having a chance to go out there, things that are out there. And that's where I sit on the high side. If we can get the right kind of information, with the right attitude, we have a possibility of sustaining things. We still have to get control of population growth. I mean, hello, you know, that wasn't it for a long time. Paul Ehrlich said, you know, it's the population bomb. And I think that that hasn't changed because it controls the amount of food we need, the kind of quality of the environment we need. And so thinking about, in my mind for management, are getting control of the things that we can control. I'm not sure we can control climate, but we can adapt to climate. And there's where I think the opportunity for sustainability is, is figuring out the direction of that climate change and what the heck we need to do to adjust our behavior patterns, to give our sense the, you know, the high side of uh, benefiting from the changes that are there. Yeah, uh, I mean, the six mass extinction is upon us and the coral, um, reefs are in a delicate state as we continue pumping more and more carbon in the atmosphere. So the, the idea of, you know, looking at some short-term issues about how do the populations that we have now um, versus how evolution writ large will, you know, sort of take care of itself, I think is an area of concern. Do you see a distinction between those two? I just see such fragility in uh, the waters that you love and I'm just wondering if, if uh, the same way that this pandemic exposed incredible vulnerabilities to, to humans, how we operate, how we do business, how we get our supply chain, how we take care of our health, do you see some extreme vulnerabilities at the horizon uh, within this very area that you uh, have spent four decades researching? That, that, that is a point of no return. That, that doesn't make you feel like Here's my, uh, yes. Here's my response to that is that, you know, do we understand the problem? And, and, and so we, sometimes it's simple enough to classify the direction of a problem to a single source and say, hey, that's it, you know. And, and I think climate change has been fingered for the reason the reefs are dying. But I say to you from where I sit, I think, yeah, certainly climate has a big, big uh, an effect on that. But says removing the entire ecosystem, the same fish community out there that we did historically, undoubtedly has changed the nature of the way the system operates, one. Two is what I'm, I just was on a, a teleconference this week with the EPA for the Keys. They're finding out the amount of sewage outfall right. associated right. with the populace decreasing during COVID, right? I mean, in essence, because the tourists aren't there. So I find this is to look a bit more broadly, bring all the facts up on the table, and look carefully at the process, right? Having a better process model. That's why computers help us, because we can put a lot of things together that we could not before. And I'm again, that puts me on the optimistic side to say, if we think it through, if we're smart enough, if, you know, we, we channel our resources in a way to get benefit, right? There's a lot of call for social change. I agree, but let's make the, the actions that we are uh, satisfying the system. I think we'll benefit as a result. Kayla, um, um, you know, there's, again, a bunch of questions, and I think I just have a couple of minutes here, but just... Uh, um, are there any thoughts on energy use and the general... And, and, um, uh, increases due to people uh, being at home and how this may be affecting the environment. What are your thoughts on energy use and its generation uh, and its impact on the environment? So the energy or the increase of energy used at home in comparison to uh, when we're not all at home is not something I've directly looked into or I don't, I haven't read anything about that quite yet. Um, but I do know that due to increased temperatures, especially those occurring this year, people's ACs have gone up. Um, and so 
you could see a slight peak in that, as you will see slight peaks in most things or slight decreases in things like carbon dioxide and NO2 and certain emissions. Um, but I don't think it will uh, kind of show in a longer term trend, right? So Thank it's you. just a small yeah. little peak. And Dr. Ald, how, how has, I'm just trying to get through these questions because I'm really almost out of time. How has COVID-19 affected field research? Um, yeah, sure. Short story is it shut it down, uh, right. which is tragic. Yes. For example, the, the, the information I'm showing about the reef fish population, we have a very innovative uh, visual survey that involves uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, the state of Florida, the National Park Service, several university partners against that whole area I'm talking about. But because we can't put scientists on boats, if you will, large numbers, essentially, and operate in close quarters. It's closed that down for a bit. So our ability to stay with it, if you will, with using humans is restricted. And so maybe technology is going to help us at the research side because we could send drones, could use acoustics. But again, we're going to have to adapt to that change. It's put a big crimp on person to person interaction. This is about the best we can do, right? The Zoom world. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're slowly crawling back into it at the university, right? We're going through a lot of restrictions and theoretically we're going to get back together in classes, et cetera, which a bit at this point scares the hell out of me. But, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely put a crimp on things. Dr. Alton, Kayla, thank you so much through your work, through your dedication, through your passion, through the scholarship and the knowledge you developed. You're helping move humanity forward. And at moments like this, moments that are so critical, moments when there's so many people that are so fearful, it's so wonderful that we're looking at evidence-based ways of, of thinking and hopefully uh, making policy. Um, thank you for the work you do. And thank you for continuing to educate and teach all of um, us about uh, where we are and how we interface and interact with this planet. Um, again, thanks you to both of you, Melanie. Uh, thank you so much Pleasure. for bringing us here. I'll turn it over to you then. Great. Thank you, Xavier, Dr. Alt, Kayla. On behalf of the university and the Palm Beach County Canes, I want to thank each of you for this great conversation that's shed a little light on the impacts that COVID and of course our recent isolation has had on our environment. Um, I'm hopeful and actually I hope we all out there in the audience challenge ourselves to maybe make just a slight change given the results we've seen from this isolation and the impacts of the environment that we attempt to do a small part on our end um, to continue to reduce the impacts that we're making on the environment and together hopefully to double Dr. Alt's point we may be able to give nature a chance. So. Thank you for joining us for this cane conversation. And as always, go canes. Go canes. Go canes. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.